We're going to begin in Proverbs 22, but we'll be turning to another section of God's Word tonight. Uh, during the uh, remaining uh, four to six weeks, because I think we're, we're through with midweek service at the end of, of April, we're going to be uh, dealing with, I thought it would be a good thing to deal with some common problems that we all face, every single person in this room, including the one that stands before you, and what does the Bible say is the solution, because one of the great things about the Bible, it doesn't just leave us with the problem, it also provides the solution to problems that we face, and this is one of the most uh, common problems that all of us have to deal with in our lives, every single one of us. Uh, Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25, it says, and then we'll turn to another section of God's Word in just a moment that, that really kind of sets it up, but uh, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this uh, very common problem that we all face. Lord, we pray that we'll better understand this problem tonight and that you'll help us uh, begin to move toward a solution to this problem. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're riding down Highway I-20 feeling pretty proud because you have left 30 minutes early for an appointment. Then it happens. You're stuck in backed up traffic. Nowhere near an exit and there's no movement. You tell me, how are you feeling? Okay. You've just grounded your teenager on the weekend of her prom. There is no prom. There is no leaving her room. There is no cell phone. You tell me, how is she feeling? We just heard the very tragic news of a student at Northwest Rankin shooting and killing her mother, who is also a teacher at Northwest Rankin. Uh, when you begin to probe that, what we're going to deal with tonight will be a major factor in that murder. Okay, the answer in both scenarios, both scenarios is this, it, it, it's anger. First two scenarios, and I'm guaranteeing you, the young lady, all of them angry. And here it is. Here's a hard-to-swallow pill, very hard-to-swallow pill of truth, exposing a potentially dark side of our emotional landscape. And here it is in double asterisks. Here it is. Everybody gets angry. Everybody gets angry. I mean, seriously, when it comes to this emotion of anger, there are two categories of people everywhere, whether it be in a church or out of a church. And it's this, two, scenario, two categories is this, those who are dealing at some level with this emotion of anger, that's the first category. The second category is liars because everybody gets angry. Now what you need to understand, so you'll better understand that everybody gets angry, is to understand that, that anger needs to be measured on a continuum, on a continuum. Uh, there, is a, there, there are degrees. We're going to go from the least level to the highest level when it comes to anger because anger is always on a continuum. It's not like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. There's no continuum. You're either pregnant or you're not. When it comes to anger, it is on a continuum. So let's look at the scale of anger starting at level one and moving to the most severe level. Level one is mild irritation. You're traveling to Disney World. You have a car full of kids. You've barely gotten to McGee. Are we there yet? 
Are we there yet? Why are we there yet? You've been by people who have jittery legs, just always moving their legs, um, eating loud, popping gum, people that get in your face like this and talk to you, um, people who will sit by you and start popping their knuckles, clicking their pens, uh, interrupting you, uh, checking, and even worse, talking on their phone when they're supposed to be talking to you, twirling their hair. I never had that problem. It just, it's some people have PhDs. It seems like they can figure out what irritates you, and then they will zero in on whatever it is that puts a burr under your saddle. And that's the first level of anger, mild irritation. Moving now to the second level. Level two is righteous or moral indignation. It's expressed in ways like this, righteous and moral indignation. I cannot believe the government is not, just fill in the blank. It bugs the fire out of me when this person takes such a vocal stand on this issue and then defames other people who disagree with them. That's just not right. It is unjust. remember Paul Harvey one time talking about the definition of a hypocrite is someone who gets all angry about the sex and violence on their VCR. Righteous moral indignation is moving up the scale of anger. Now we get to level three. It's a more forceful, ongoing, vindictive wrath. More forceful, ongoing, vindictive wrath. Now, usually when you think about wrath, you think about, whew, you know, lightning bolt. That's not actually what wrath is. Uh, wrath is, it's, it's something that's intense and ongoing within you. When you perceive something as being unjust, if you feel betrayed, and it just gets more intense, that feeling. And you, you, get to the point where you say, you know, I'm never going to drop how I feel about what this person did to me. It may be years ago. There's no way they can make it up to me. Um, you know, it's the old Hatfields and McCoys. They've been mad at each other so long, they forgot what it is that made them mad at each other to begin with. Silence, avoidance. You've met people who just look like they're angry all the time about something. There's talk show people on the left, there's talk show people on the right who just seem to have this ongoing anger, just this bubbling, simmering anger, which, if not dealt with, can move up to another level, level four. Got mild irritation, moral, righteous indignation, more forceful, ongoing, vindictive wrath. Number four, a fit of frenzied fury. Everything's just going on. Suddenly, boom, there's a throwdown. You see this a lot of times with Nick Saban on the sideline. Uh, there was a coach I'll tell you about later that falls into the next category, Columbia Academy, that I coached against when I was coaching back in the day. Um, in the semifinals, college football playoff, on one team, several players got mad and threw their helmets on the turf as hard as they could and stormed off. They didn't even bother to pick up their helmets. Now, I know some people are going to spin that and say, well, they're just passionate. No, that's fury. That's fury. Um, you may have experienced fury before. Have you ever been a, a victim of uh, someone pulling up beside you and telling you non-certain terms what they think about your driving? Uh, that person is furious at you. Um, I saw not too long ago a waitress and a customer at a restaurant escalating to the point where one of them got furious at the other. That's the next level. Now the worst level, the one that is so destructive, is level five. It goes past mild irritation, past moral indignation about 
what you perceive as wrong or unjust. It goes past this simmering wrath that's just boiling underneath the surface and can erupt any time. It goes past frenzied fury. Level five is out of control rage. Out of control rage. Totally out of control, irrational, explosive, destructive. Talking about this coach that I coached against. The referee, uh, we were ahead three to nothing. Is the first quarter of the game. A referee called a call this opposing coach did not agree with, and it was on his home turf, by the way. And the coach got angry, started cursing, started yelling. The, the referee blew the whistle, threw a flag, marked off 15 yards. He screamed louder, threw another 15 yards. He picked up a, a chair and threw it out on the field. So the referee looked, he went, game over, winner, pointed to our team. The game was called in the first quarter because this coach was so infuriated with rage, just engorged with rage, that there was no way. And then what's interesting is 15 minutes later, he was telling the athletic director at that academy, I don't remember doing that. Now, maybe he didn't because people who, who are um, people who are affected by rage, sometimes they don't remember what they did when they were in a rage. Think about wife beaters. Something snaps, they don't remember. Um, perhaps an angry rant is posted on social media, and then they take it down. Rage. That's the worst level. Now, how many of you people in the last seven days have hit at least one of those levels? Come on. Oh, come on. <laughs> I was fixing to say, if, 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 if you hadn't hit one of those levels, then you're under that second category of people I was talking to earlier. Um, you know, you, you've been on that scale this week, maybe today. Maybe in the last hour. Just think about it. So, we need to explore this, this emotion. And the best place to explore it actually comes from a minor prophet by the name of Jonah. So turn to Jonah. Turn to Jonah. If you don't know where to find that, turn to your table of contents and look up Jonah. And then turn to Jonah chapter 4. This is a narrative, and it has a lot to tell us about anger. A lot to tell us, because what we're going to do is we're going to really analyze this emotion tonight, and then we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we're going to, well, you, you'll see. Okay. Jonah chapter 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Now, this is because God did not destroy Nineveh. That's why he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still on? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarsus. I knew you were gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity. The Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. The Lord, pro the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Have you any right to be angry? When I get angry, this is the next part, double asterisk. When I get angry, I would do well to ask myself the question that Yahweh asked Jonah in Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, and that's this What do you have to be angry about? Or in the NIV, it's, is it right for you to be angry? Not are you angry, obviously you are. But the question is, what do you have to be angry about? And is it right to be angry? I want to suggest to you this evening that that is a surgical question. The Lord's question walks on the life stage. It pulls our mask off. It reveals something about the subconscious desires of my heart. 
See, what anger is is this. It's a whistleblower. It's a whistleblower that reveals something inside our hearts. Anger is like a red light on your dashboard. It's a symptom of something. And as anger goes up the scale, anger can turn into a deadly sin. Now, I want to share a quote with you, a quote from a book entitled The Gift of Anger. You may have never thought of anger as being a gift, but here's the quote from this, from this book by Marcia Cannon. And I'll repeat it a couple of times because uh, if you think about it, you need to go home and just kind of read over this quote and think about it. Uh, double asterisk. You become angry when you define reality as unacceptable to you. You become angry when you define reality as unacceptable to you. You do not accept what is there. And you feel unable to easily correct that reality, tolerate that reality, or let that reality go. Here's something that's happened. It has happened. It's real. It's unacceptable. You feel like you're unable to correct it. You can't tolerate it, and you sure can't let it go. So what does Scripture tell us about, tell us to do with the potential sin of anger? Well, you say potential sin. What do you mean? Isn't anger always a sin? Quick answer is no. We'll parse that out in a few minutes. But before the diagnosis and the diffusing of this potential atomic bomb of anger, some observations. Some observations. These are all in bullet points. First observation is this. Anger is an emotion with deep, historical, widespread roots and branches. Anger is an emotion with deep, historical, widespread roots and branches. As a matter of fact, from a biblical, cultural, historical perspective, the first evidence of sin's devastation was involved anger. Genesis 4, Cain and Abel. He hated his brother. He killed him. He was angry at his brother. The breadth of this sin is it's omnicultural, that is, it's all people and all uh, omnicultural, omnihistorical, all people at all times, omnigenerational. It happens at every age. Anger is a kudzu growing everywhere in our culture. And the question that I ask here is, could anger be one of the first emotions we express? Well, how many of you ever heard an infant cry? Okay. Um, infused in the earliest screams of a baby is an all-consuming rage that if they had hands as big and functional as ours, those sweet little babies would wrap those hands around our necks. <laughs> Listen, children, infants can definitely define reality as unacceptable. You can't have this. No! When? And they insist everyone knows how unacceptable it is. Whether they're hungry or not sharing, we've all seen enough red faces smeared with tears to know that anger meets us all when we're young. And you know what? We never outgrow it. Uh, we often morph into four-year-olds when we don't get our way. So what are some of, the, some of the different ways adult anger is expressed? Here we go. Here's some ways. How's adult anger expressed? Basically four ways. There's rage containers. Rage containers. That's people who clam up. They dam up their anger. They keep it inside. They get ulcers. They get all kind of problems, stress headaches, high blood pressure, until... Well, rage containers until next, there's rage spewers. They dam up, they clam up, they keep it inside, and eventually they erupt like a volcano of anger. And that hot lava burns everything around them. They, they, they spew 
rage and anger. But there's another kind of anger that adults express. There, there's cold anger. Rage containers, rage spewers, cold anger. Uh, this is record-keeping anger. I never forget, I never forgive. I don't get angry, I just get even. I'm going to freeze this person out. They'll never hear anything from me again. I'll never do anything for them again. They are dead to me. That's an expression of anger. Rage containers, rage spewers, cold anger, and there's hot anger. We talked about that a little bit. Fits of rage, aggravated people. Remember a man telling my daddy, this guy had a bad anger problem. He said, well, well Pastor, it's okay with me. I, I blow up and then it's all over. You know what Dad says? Said to him, he said, yes, so does a bomb. But look at the damage it does. Some people shout, some people pout. Anger is a most dangerous emotion. That's the next bullet point. Anger, this is a most dangerous emotion. As a matter of fact, the uninhibited expression of anger can quite literally kill. I remember Wednesday afternoon, 1996, sitting in the office of, of Alta Woods Presbyterian Church, got a call from Mississippi Baptist Medical Center. Could you please come and meet with the family of a firefighter who has been shot? The family did not even know the firefighter had been shot. They wanted me to break the news to the family that the firefighter had been shot. Shot to death by an angry fellow firefighter fighter who had been fired earlier that week. We had something happen uh, it, it, not too long ago, just around the corner from us. Anger erupting. Dangerous emotion. You say, say well, I, I, I don't get the connection between, between anger and, and hate. Well, guess what? Jesus does. Matthew 5, 21 and 22 he puts anger and murder on the same continuum. And then Jesus' half-brother, John, in 1 John 3.15, let me just read that to you in the interest of time. 1 John 3.15, let me just listen to what it says. It says, anyone who hates his brother, this is pretty clear. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that mur no murderer has eternal life in him friends even short of murder anger can cause harm to others these people do things we would not normally do think about when you've in anger smashed a hole in a wall broken a window in a car splintered a cell phone against the sidewalk shattered a valuable piece of china posted something really bad really ugly really distasteful about someone else on social media, and why? Because they made me mad. Friends, you know, the American justice system, did you know it has a category for this kind of harm? It's called crimes of passion. A crime by someone so uh, irritated, uh, inebriated by anger, they make a foolish decision to say or do something they would not normally say or do. The emotion of anger is filled with tremendous power to disorient us. But here's the next bullet point, and this is going to kind of, you'll get a little bit of equilibrium thrown off with this next statement. You're going to have to hang with me, though, if you want to work through this. Next bullet point is this. Not all expressions of anger, of this emotion, are sin. You say, what? Really? Really? How does this emotion of anger distinguish itself from other sins? In one significant way, here it is. It's under that bullet point. Here's how it differs from other sins. This emotion distinguishes itself in this way. God gets angry. Think about that. God gets angry. God in Psalm uh, 711 is, is fed up. He 
He's indignant about injustice. In Mark 3, 5, Jesus throws the money, changer out, money changers out of the temple. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, it says uh, he's going to be inflicting vengeance towards those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel. Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is revealed against all who repress the truth and unrighteousness. All those are expressions of anger, but yet God does not sin. God is incapable of sinning. He doesn't sin. So what does this show you? What hope does this give you? Here it is. Here it is. Since God is angry and does not sin, there's hope for us. Turn real quickly with me now to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Because there's a verse here that's really interesting. Speaking of how to live as children of light, how to live in a Christian way. It says, Ephesians 4.26. Listen to this now. Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, do not sin. Did you know it's even stronger in the Greek? In the Greek, it's a command. Be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin, which brings us to our last double asterisk, and here it is. The cause of anger, not the experience of anger, is what qualifies anger as either sinful or righteous. Notice it's not showing anger. It's the cause of anger, not the experience of anger is what qualifies anger as being either sinful or righteous. It's not that you're angry. It's why you're angry. That makes it either sinful or not. Next lesson, this is what we're going to answer. One question is this. What is the main issue underlying the problem of sinful anger? Did you know that sinful anger boils down to one issue? The driving force, the fuel that feeds the fire of anger boils down to one word. And you're going to be completely surprised at what that word is. Totally. What is the word that feeds anger? Main issue boils down to one word. Surprise, surprise. Number two. What is the solution to the problem we have with anger? There is a solution. How do we deal with this ongoing problem in our lives? Because there is a time when you will never be angry again. It's in the new heavens and new earth. It's after you die. Until then, it's going to be a problem. See, our God is not a, a critic without a solution. One of the best pieces of advice Roy Taylor ever gave me is he said, when someone comes to you criticizing something going on in the church, look at them and say, so what is your solution to this problem? Not can, anyone can be a critic. What is your solution to the problem? God is never a critic who does not give a solution. We will discover next week a solution to this problem that we all face, this problem called anger. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who is redemptive in all your purposes, redemptive in all your actions. Lord, we acknowledge that we all display anger at some level. Lord, help us to understand this, this emotion better. But most of all, Lord, help us to actually dig down and discover together this coming week, what, 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 what does this issue boil down to? And what is the solution? How can we deal with this issue in a way that brings glory to you, brings good to us, and brings good to those we deal with? Lord, again, thank you for your word and the sheer practicality of it. We pray, God, that you'll uh, bless us this week and uh, prepare us now as we Go to Palm Sunday as we have our cantata Sunday night. We look forward to that. 
look forward to the to the Good Friday service. We look forward to Easter, Lord. We we thank you that that you came to bring redemption to us at every level, including our emotions. We pray, God, you'll bless us between now and this coming Lord's Day. In Jesus' name, amen.